I'd like to talk about Obra Negra, which is a series of drawings I'm showing at the moment at the North Dakota Museum of Art. And I'll, I'll begin by explaining a little bit about the title of the work. It's called Obra Negra, which is a Spanish expression for something that is undergoing construction. Most of uh, the houses in the slums have a very long constructing process. It takes usually two or three generations before completion. And that's the state of those houses whilst they are being produced or finished. And I thought uh, the title was very eloquent because when you visit these slums, that's all you see. All these houses are midway before completion. The roofs are probably not finished, the walls. So everything is uh, in a way very chaotic. Um, not very good for living in them. It's difficult conditions for all the people living in them. So that's what gave the name to the whole series. An overview of, of the series of drawings would be um, the very fragile structure of these constructions made by hand, where there are no um, preliminary plans, where there is no architect or engineering uh, studies beforehand but people just doing their own house with very little means and very little knowledge of what they're doing, but uh, they manage to construct these buildings and, and make them lasting buildings, at least for a couple of years. When I started to do the work, I was very much focused on the buildings themselves, on the structure, on the asymmetry of, of these buildings. They all looked in a different stage, in a, in a different shape. And because they are made of little parts, just like a collage, there is no uniformity at all. I became more and more aware of the fact that the fragility was not only in the structure and the poor materials that were used, but also on the inhabitants of those houses, and especially on uh, the role that uh, small girls are, are being um, pushed into a situation where they have to look for after their smaller brothers and sisters or very elderly people. So there is an enormous burden on their shoulders to keep these houses going um, despite their very short age. The mothers are usually the ones responsible for finding this very little spot where they, they start constructing. Uh, they have large amounts of, of children at very early age, at 25, for example, they will already have five or six children. There have been a non-declared war for many, many, many years. It's calculated about 50 or 60 years uh, going on this civil war. So country women um, are left on their own to keep, uh, to keep their families together and find all the resources for their own children until they can't keep going on living in the countryside. So they flee to the big cities to try and find a job or some, some other means to have their family together and care for them. Um, but these women have very little education and usually the jobs they can do are very badly paid and they have to work very, very long hours. So they are not around the house to take care of their children. So they leave uh, this task to do their eldest daughter. Even if they have older boys, uh, the task will go to the little girl because it's like a role they are imposed since very, very young. I'd like to talk about uh, how these uh, slums developed and why the problem became so big. It's um, around the 50s, around the 60s, that the cities grew very, very rapidly, very, very largely, because all the country people had to flee to the cities. And imagine one city as large as Grand Forks will be added to uh, a city every year. So it's, it's so big, it's so fast that even if there were some means to, to make it work, 
it just grows too fast and the government uh, uh, governmental aid is is not enough to to accommodate all, all these people at, at at that at that rate at that uh, velocity most uh, of the slums began in rich or wealthy uh, neighborhoods that were derelict that, that became less and less appealing for the former inhabitants so the houses began to get squatted and in one house where a large family used to live suddenly it was squatted by 20 25 uh, families at the same time of course running water was no longer available uh, neither electricity anything else so they became the center of a new slum some of the houses around uh, were turned down or simply couldn't take the, the weight or the circumstances of having um, too many people that were torn down. And around those big houses, probably first in the yards, then on the streets, on, on the other, other yards around, other houses were built with, with very little means, with cardboard, with wood, uh, scrap wood, whatever they would find that probably it could serve as a as a way of having something similar to a roof. Usually these houses are, are built in very small areas and the only way to, to grow or to have a, a, an additional space is to go up. So they have usually two or three stores above them, but because they are very fragile because of the poor materials, because there is no engineering or any studies of building them during the process. Um, they tend to go down most of the time. Usually the terrain is also very weak. Sometimes it's only sand or the, it's uh, terrains where the floods are very frequent. And it's uh, very steep as well because the terrains they occupy are terrains where nobody else can really construct anything there. So they are very weak, they are very fragile. They usually make their way to electricity in an illegal way. They really rob it from other posts. Of when they see um, a regular electricity pole, they just make a connection, a handmade connection, and they take that electricity to the house. Of course, that's very dangerous. Most of the fires begin in that way because of shortcut circuits. It's a very small space for a lot of people, so they, they have very little commodities. There are no, no bathrooms, no water supply. One of the things that um, is very remarkable about, about that is that they start all these houses in a very secret way. There is, for example, in, a, in one of the photographs, one settlement that, that has started within the National Park, you could compare it to Hyde Park in, in London. To, it's in the central part of the city and it's supposed to be a very beautiful park for everybody. And what they did is go to the most remote part of the, of the park and start in the hiding to build the house. When Once they have already the first floor and the roof, they won't be able to be thrown out of there because they have some some rights. So they they try and and get to that first stage because they know yeah. it's a good way to be to be allowed to stay there for for a while. In the city center, for example, there are other settlements. There was a bigger house, for example, no longer mm, good for selling because nobody wanted to buy it. So probably that house was being partitioned between many other families. So every time they made the space smaller and smaller and every family wanted to, to build an annex, uh, another room, another, another part of the house for, for a larger uh, family. That's another characteristic that's um, usually because the, the process of construction is so long uh, every time the family grows, they try and make accommodate the new member into the house or, or new members because it's usually a very large families. And that's, that's the reason why it's always, always under construction, always making like, like a new room and a new space. They all start before it is a house, it's like a, just a hut. 
and little by little they start uh, gathering other materials and improving what there really is. In the 80s there was an, an English architect called John Turner who, who said for the first time that uh, probably the slums were not, the, not a problem but part of the solution because all these people were like trying to see by themselves something that the government couldn't give them. So I, I think it's uh, very interesting to see how, how they have this uh, strategy of construction and despite not having uh, the knowledge or the means to do the, the house, they, they overcome all these difficulties and do it with their own hands and they make it work. So it really is a matter of educating them and giving them very li little means and and just uh, a way to start and, and try and use all that, that they have been doing for many years to improve what they started. So I think it's being able to question that it's, it's not something that makes a city ugly, but what makes a city really be annexed uh, to, the, to the city and make it work because all these people, they have a reason for going to the large cities, it's not just because they want to, they, they have to, so it's, it's an opportunity for them. So it's, in a way, it's also um, a, a, a matter of trying to open up and, and have, them, have them welcome and, and uh, give them some credit at what they're doing. It's an amazing, amazing job. These slums eventually get annexed to the city Years and years later, after they start, many politicians go and they bring bricks or tin parts just because they want the votes of these inhabitants. But at the end, they usually have not the property itself, but they have the use of the land after 20 years. But after a very long struggle, they can never sell their own house. They can inherit the right to the family members, but they can never sell. So one of the problems, the big problems also is they will never be able to have mortgage on that property. So what other people would uh, have like a guarantee for a loan or something like that, they, they will never get that opportunity. One of the first things that is being legalized in these settlements is electricity because what they want is to um, give the, each one of the families a number so they can send the bill and that's the first, the first thing they get. Once uh, they have the electricity, all the other services little by little start uh, trying to, to, to get to them, also to, to make them pay what they are using until finally they have the use of that property. It's very common as well that the girls start their own families very, very early at the age of 14 or even 13. They get pregnant and they have their families. Most of the time their mothers throw them out because they are not supposed to have any sexual contact but because of the conditions they live in, very tight spaces and very, very crowded, it's very common that much older men get them pregnant, but all the fault is blamed on, on the girls, so everything starts all over again. They are left on their own with a baby or sometimes with two babies. It's very common that at 15 or 16 they are already widows, so they are left on their own, they have one or two children and the only way they know is just go and occupy little terrain and start their own house. So it's um, a never-ending um, never story. It's, it starts all over again.